what we love, what we cherish, like this misty rainforest, this ancient rainforest of Borneo, are now turned into monocrops. Please welcome Matthias Alexander of Klum. Thank you. All right. Um, as a young boy, I actually lived um, all my summers I spent where Ulf Danielsson uh, was born, actually, in Ludvika. And my parents actually were born there, so that's sort of a natural thing. Uh, and I learned to love nature. I remember I looked also at the dark skies, looking out into the abyss. I never really felt the sense of vertigo, but I definitely wondered, like all of us, what's out there. But what also captivated my, my uh, entire existence was the fact that there was so much in the grass, so much among the trees, so much beneath the surface that just waited to be explored in every single pond. And I grew up learning really to love that and to try to capture that with my camera. I remember I borrowed my father's camera when I was a child, really, and he said, well, if you're careful, you might, you can use it. And, uh, but you can only borrow it for, for a certain amount of time. I borrowed it for a long time. Actually, uh, I still have it. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. He's up there somewhere watching us. So all of these things that inhabit this incredible, fragile planet inspires me. Could be the flying bond or the big white-tailed eagle, two and a half meter wingspan of a female just above my blind as I wait in the archipelago outside of Stockholm. A true success story in a time where so many things are going the wrong way. They have come back in a remarkable way, facing new challenges with uh, all sorts of old sins in the shape of uh, chemical pollution. But however, it's a success story. However, when I was about 23 years old, I got extremely lucky. Uh, I came to Washington, D.C., and I remember I, I probably looked like I was 13 or 12, because everyone looked at me like, God, you look like somebody's grandson. And I said, I am. <laughs> Uh, and, and they didn't laugh, but thank you so much. Um, and they actually believed in me, which was great. They said, we won't do, uh, I'm sitting in this corner office in Washington, D.C. Uh, with two quite intimidating uh, uh, heads of photography, Koberstein and Kennedy. And they said, Matthias, we want to send you out into the wild to come back with pictures we have never seen before. And I remember thinking, I'm dead. I can never deliver. But in some kind of a frustrated uh, mode, I said, uh, I'll do my utmost, uh, and you bet I will. I said, that's a good spirit. So they sent me off to Borneo and to 99 other countries uh, for the last 22 years or so. This is Borneo. I've spent a lot of time in Borneo. I actually feel that that's one of my second homes in the world. And I realized there are no shortcuts if you want to find and photograph the hidden gems in the web of life. And I remember growing up with, with incredible sources of inspiration like Dr. Goodall, my friend Jane, sitting right here. And I remember how incredible it was the first time I got really close to the remarkable orangutans being able to hear the females calling their young with a strange sound. And when you imitated them, the, the babies would look down on you and say, Ooh, who are you? Are you from Uppsala? It was quite a, a remarkable journey. And I realized that as I was photographing, filming the beauty of life, everything that moved me so deeply 
juxtaposed to that reality were the huge impacts of our journey, our success story. And I realized that we are in the hangover phase of humanity's success story. We've had such a good run. When I was born, we were three and a half billion people. We're 7.6 billion at this moment, putting incredible pressure on our planet. So that what we love, what we cherish, like this misty rainforest, this ancient rainforest of Borneo, are now turned into monocrops. And I remember how disappointed and how hard it was to actually get these images into the magazine pages of National Geographic. Because it was not really at that point when I started to pitch stories showing the whole story really accepted. It's like, yeah, it's, it's too bad it's happening, but let's concentrate on the good stuff. Let's concentrate on the beauty. Let's concentrate on all the miracles of life. And I said, where's the sense of urgency? Where's this burning notion in my belly? Why is my soul hurting? So I was so proud when I started to be able to do stories for them, also addressing these issues. And when we sit here in Sweden, or we're in Seattle, or in London, we might point our long fingers and say, that's horrible what they do in Indonesia. It's crazy what they do in the Congo. How can they be so stupid in Australia? They are letting their runoffs destroy the coral reefs. But today with the connectivity, where we all are shopping in an affluent style, we are contributing each and every one of us, if we're not careful. We are also behind these tipping points. What has moved me increasingly is the fact that it all hangs together. It's all coexistently triggered. And I remember when I realized that uh, Carl Linnaeus, the king of botany, the Swedish a uh, superhero in the world of, of um, science, I should say. I mean, we have a few superheroes. I mean, Ulf Danielson is a superhero. But I mean, Carl Linnaeus was a, a, a short man. He was like the, the artist Prince. He was a, sort of a tiny guy, but with a huge ego, apparently. He would walk around and say, God created, but I, Linnaeus, I put it all into order. And he said all at that time that it's all connected. Everything is connected. And he, I don't think he understood how true this is. Because even the coral reefs in Raja Ampat in Indonesia is coexisting in a strange way, climatologically, hydrologically, biologically, with the ice caps, the polar regions. Conveyable currents. All the things that we now know interact. So when we readily destabilize the systems, we create a problem. My friend Johan Rockström would say, would say that nature is now starting to send invoices back to our economy. That's exactly what happens. Well, I'm merely a storyteller and a photographer and artist. So what I try to do is find ambassadors to talk about. These are the yellow thinned barracudas swaying just outside the reef or hovering like they've done for 50 million years. You can see these little buggers here. These are cleaner rats. It's like the service team at a pit stop or the uh, massage therapist or the manicurist or pedicurist. And these big predator fish could obviously kill them, but they won't. You won't eat your service staff. And this is how nature works. And when we humans understand this beautiful coexistence, these symbiotic relationships, we say, wow, nature is pretty cool. It's exactly like within our body, but we don't acknowledge how incredible it really is and that we are depending on the nature to deliver. This is a world famous superstar. You know this guy, Nemo, the clownfish. It's a great example also of a coexistent life 
drama with the anemones and this clownfish, interacting, coexisting in an amazing way. And um, when you have a huge audience or a small audience, PPM curves and statistics do it for some, but clownfish do it for others. I remember you know, I can have three and a half thousand kids in a theater in Seattle. It's hard to get the PPM curves across. You talk about them, you show little graphs and say, do you guys understand what I'm saying right now, PPM? Parts per million? They say, yeah, I No, Nemo explains it all. They understand Nemo, they understand chimpanzees, they understand the things that we borrow from the past into the future. They understand that part. And they understand it much better and more readily than many politicians and decision makers in the world. They really understand it. They understand that killing 100,000 sharks per day is not a wise thing to do because it destabilizes the system. It's like taking away, ridding all the major cities in the world, all the fire squads, all the police, all the hospitals. It is a stupid thing to do. Isn't that nice? It's very simplified, but it's like, there you go. So this is the desired state. This is beautiful, brimful with life. 1,550 species of fish right here. 700 reef building corals. It is a resilient system delivering services to mankind. 450 million people daily eat fish, sort of relating to coral reefs in the world. But now 75% of the coral reefs are not doing all too well due to many, we call them quadruple whammies, hits from mankind, including bleaching, plastics, chemistry, runoffs from, from um, logged areas, etc. So these things go into undesired states where they deliver zero euro or dollars or whatever to Wall Street and Davos. It goes into this. You go from this to this. This is the legacy of our incredible success. And to me, as a boy in Ludvika or Uppsala, looking at this tiny toad, this frog, this damselfly or this orchid, or just a plain toad with its orange, golden, bloody, beautiful eye, to me it's mind-boggling what we're doing. If you talk to your physician, you go to your doctor and you say, uh, do I need the organs in my body to function? Uh, he or she will say, I'm sorry, could you, I don't really, no, 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 I, I'm serious, uh, do I need my liver? Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to have. It's, 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 good, it's good for you. Yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't mess with your liver. It's, uh, it's, it's, you should you know, maintain a, a healthy, resilient, sustainable system. What about my lungs? It's pretty difficult. You can survive with one lung or you can use a machine. You can be sort of wired into a, a wall. Kidneys, yeah, it's, it's problematic. What about brain? In your case, I'm not really sure <laughs> if you need your brain. When it comes to nature in our world, on this beautiful, fragile planet, it's always a discussion what we need. It's always a discussion if this is something we truly need to prioritize. This incredible planet, this Antarctic landscape that creates hydrologic, climatologic balance where you have, again, ambassadors indicating when things are not going well, that can signal the big fluctuations, the man-made anthropogenic fluctuations that we are triggering with our affluent lifestyles. Anyway, this female was so beautiful. I've never met a female or actually any polar bear this cooperative. It's like, oh my God, it's Matthias Alexandrov Klum from National Geographic. Is this good for you? <laughs> A hysterical. And then eventually she fell asleep with her cubs 
uh, not just a stone's throw. I mean, I could actually spit. I mean, it was like so close. And she, she was relaxed. They were a little bit wary, but eventually she calmed them down and I could photograph them. And this is like the best reward in my life to get this kind of thing. And it moves me, it moves my heart that these things still can be seen, that we still have something really to fight for. She is the ambassador. She is the communicator. She is really changing things for many people. I will end with a short story on uh, an ecosystem and why an ecosystem needs is, it, you know, basically the functions, that is, the life forms. It's like having a body without organs, without cells, without anything. How can it function? Well, it really can't. It's, it's a tough thing to, to, to uh, even, you know, to grasp. That, that, that we can be so stupid not to acknowledge that we need the miracles of life to maintain a resilient economy, a st stable climate, a stable earth for generations to come. This is the Okavango Delta, flushing about 11 cubic kilometers of water every year. 11 cubic kilometers, it's a lot of water. It's the largest locked uh, water delta in the world. Um, Africa's pumping water heart. How could it work without its ecosystem engineers? Would it function without the little elephants here plowing their way through these deltas, the elephant trails? The answer is not likely. Could we have innovations that could solve this? Mm, problematic. It's sort of an not so easy to manage. And this is a natural legacy thing. Sometimes when we put a price tag on animals like the, the Teeb people, Pavan Sukdev, it's a great thing for businesses, but we also forget about the moral and ethical dimensions of things. This beautiful elephant coming next to me by a termite mound is a masterpiece of creation. This is another very grumpy ecosystem engineers engineer. She's by, by far the most grumpy one I know. They, they are rumored to have or believed to have a very poor uh, morning manner, uh, afternoon uh, temper. Uh, they're basically pissed off all day long. But they are also very, very important, perhaps the most important ecosystem engineer in the Okavango Delta. Maintaining a balance, eating, uh, eutrophicating, etc., in, the, in, the, in a balanced way as it stands now. The leopard, one of the most beautiful and uh, most amazing cats, also a systematic trigger. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very unique species that is also part of this functional system. One of the organs, if you may, if you m simplify it, very important. These days I have four children, and you might, some of you might know me as Matthias Klum, if you know me at all, and you, you heard this name in the middle, Alexandra, and that is because I've been so fortunate to be married to Iris, that's right here, and her name is Alexandra, and in these days we, we basically put everything together. And we have now four kids. We have six, nine, thirteen, and sixteen, and they all wonder how their future is going to look. The six-year-old, Dorian, he would say, I want to become a filmmaker. I want to search for lions. I want to be able to dive with sharks. He's a smart guy. I'm sure he will. But I am, we are worried that the lukewarm waters of Raja Ampar will not be brimful with color, that the tigers in India might not be there, that these lions that have lost 75% of their population the last hundred years will not really be there. The chimpanzees in Gombe, the, all the things we cherish that are triggers and beautiful indicators of this beautiful earth, we need to safeguard and protect. So I think if there's anything I want to say, and I, I'm sure uh, Dr. Goodall, wonderful Jane, will allude possibly to this in her upcoming talk, 
is that it's not up to us, the three of us speakers here, to try to convince you, you are all ambassadors. We are all ambassadors for change with our daily choices, regardless of platform in life. And I thank you so much for being here. Thank you.